Strange Wills. Stories of strange wills made by strange people, starring the distinguished Hollywood actor Warren William, and featuring Marvin Miller and Lorene Tuttle with Howard Culver, and the original music of Del Castillo. I devise and bequeath to my heirs the seven deadly sins. Despair, anger, jealousy, revenge, lust, envy, and hate. And here is Warren William. These are the stories of strange wills gathered from probate courts the world over. Many of them written on deathbeds or under highly emotional circumstances clearly show that the writers of the wills use this last chance of self-expression to vindicate within their own hearts the flagrant sins of omission and remission made during their lifetimes. Names, places, and time have all been changed in order that no reflection may fall on any person or persons living or dead. From the dusty vaults of the probate court, we bring you documentary proof of the old adage that man is the strangest of all creatures. You'll presently see what I mean. But first, I'd like to have you listen to a few words from your announcer. Back to Warren William as John Francis O'Connell in Black Interlude. Of all the sins that live within the human heart, none is so deadly, so lasting as hate. Unchecked, it bears the bitter fruit of mental and spiritual annihilation, nor does it always end with death. Its vibrations reach out of the grave like the tentacles of an octopus in a last effort to win the final victory of a bitter revenge. Why did Francis X. Blair hate his only son, Paul, with a hatred as intense and boundless as the elements? The reason is as old as Eve. Francis X. Blair, rich, handsome, and a widower, and his son, Paul, were both in love with the same girl. Francis X. Blair had been my client for nearly ten years. He was dominant, relentless, and headstrong, the kind of a man who took what he wanted, no matter what the hurt. Paul was like his dead mother, shy and sensitive. His talents ran to the literary. How he ever managed to take the lovely and beautiful Phyllis Lamar away from his father, I'll never know. But insiders told me that it was just a case of love at first sight. Everyone who knew about it was anxiously waiting to hear whom her final choice would be, father or son. And then one cold November night, Francis X. Blair invited me over to his penthouse apartment to discuss his will. I knew that something extraordinary was about to happen. Telling me to be a good loser, John, may be the conventional thing to say. But unfortunately, I've never lived in the conventional manner. Oh, why can't you forget and forgive them both, Francis? After all, Phyllis has made her choice. And while she may prefer Paul as a husband, <laughs> you can still have her as a daughter. I'm sorry that I can't agree with you. I consider my son in the light of a thief. A love thief, if you like. But the fact remains that he deliberately took away from me the one thing in my life that I cherished most highly. I would have preferred it if he had robbed my safe. It would have been more honorable. He's got to pay for his sin, and she will pay for her folly. Why don't you sleep over it for a few days, Francis? I'm sure that with sober reflection... It won't be necessary. I have made my final decision. From this day on, my son is disinherited. I want you to redraft my will, cutting him off with one dollar. But surely you aren't serious. Paul is just out of school a few years. He isn't equipped. Let him starve, then, and the girl with him. 
She'll come crawling back to me on her knees one of these fine days, begging my forgiveness. Francis, I beg you not to be hasty. I'm sorry, but it's too late. I hate Paul Blair as I've never hated another soul, living or dead. I want him to suffer, just as he has made me suffer. I'll hate him until my dying breath. And if I can, I'll go on hating him from my grave. And this is the last time I will ever mention his name again, as long as I live. Nor did the next two years bring a change of heart. Francis X. Blair grew more bitter day by day, if such a thing was possible. His will was prepared and executed according to his wishes. But I still hoped that before he died, he would relent and repent. Paul and Phyllis, meanwhile, were quietly married and were living in a small furnished apartment on the outskirts of town. On the night of their first wedding anniversary, they invited me to dinner. <laughs> and I want to offer my congratulations on this, the first year of your happiness together. And don't think we haven't been happy, Mr. O'Connell. Paul has been wonderful. Well, I had to make up in some way for all the millions she lost by not marrying Dad. Oh, I was such talking nonsense. <laughs> no, how is Dad, Mr. O'Connell? You know, I haven't seen or heard from him in almost two years. Tell me, has he softened any? No, I'm afraid not, Paul. In fact, he's more bitter than ever. Of course, there's always a chance, always the possibility he may... We don't want any chances, do we, Paul? We have our own plans now, our own dreams, too. I think good comes out of everything, Mr. O'Connell. If Paul hadn't been disinherited, do you think he would ever have taken a job as a reporter? That's where he learned to write. And I agree with you, Phyllis. I think Paul has a brilliant future as a writer. One day, with you behind him... Oh, oh everything would be fine if... if Dad would only forgive me. I know it sounds foolish to you, Mr. O'Connell, but his continual hatred for me is preying on my mind. You see, I've never hated... And, and the thought of someone hating me, well... Now, I'm sure you feel badly about it, Paul. But you see, you've wounded your father's ego. <laughs> That's a dangerous thing to do to anybody. I've told Phyllis this before, and she laughed at me, but I want to tell you too, Mr. O'Connell. Sometimes I... Well, I imagine I hear my father laughing at me. Laughing as though he expected something to happen to me, something... Oh, please, Paul, get that thought out of your mind. Nothing that your father can say or do will change anything. Our lives are our own. We're the masters of our own destinies. Voodoo, witchcraft, and superstitions are obsolete. When next you see Francis X. Blair, Mr. O'Connell, <laughs> please ask him to stay out of Paul's dreams. He may not know it, but I'm getting a problem child on my hands. But I never saw Francis X. Blair again, that is, alive. He died in his sleep just two days after my visit with Paul and Phyllis, and he had neither forgiven nor forgotten. I attended the funeral and sat with Paul and Phyllis. Paul looked disconsolate, discouraged that the hatred in his father's heart was being carried to his grave. Benedicat vos omnipotens Deus, et pater et filius, et spiritus sanctus, requiescat in pace. Amen. As the little funeral procession walked slowly out of the church, I wondered if this was to be the end of hate. Surely death would be the great healer. Had not the late Francis X. Blair done enough hurt to more than compensate for his lost love? Well, I thought so. But early one evening, several months later... Yes? Mr. O'Connell? Yes. Oh, Mr. O'Connell, this is Phyllis Blair. I've only got a minute to speak to you. I'm here at the airport with Paul. We're leaving, Mr. O'Connell, leaving for good. We're flying to the West Coast. For good? Heavens, what's happened? Paul is standing just outside the booth. I don't want him to hear me. Mr. O'Connell, Paul said that he couldn't live here another day. Since his father's death, he's grown worse instead of better. He says that he hears his father still laughing at him. He says if he doesn't go immediately, he's, he's liable to lose his mind. Oh, I've got to go now. He's getting suspicious. Phyllis, I want you to keep in touch with me. I'll help you, both of you, all that I can. Maybe it's best to... Hello? Hello? 
Hello? Number, please. Oh, never mind, operator. So this was it. The hatred of father for son was really living on, coming up like some shrouded ghost from the tomb to encompass and destroy. I recall the old familiar proverb, hell hath no fury like a woman scorned. I wondered why they stopped with a woman. What about a man? What about the dead? Where did fury end, I wondered. A few months later, I received my first letter from Phyllis. The change had done Paul good. He'd turned to freelance writing and was concentrating on radio scripts. They were building their lives anew. Yes, it was a long way from the grave of Francis X. Blair to the West Coast. Long enough, I hoped. I felt happy about Paul and Phyllis for the first time in months. But one night, quite unexpectedly, I received a telegram. It was from Phyllis. She told me the very thing that I'd been fearing. Paul had been committed. Committed to an institution for the insane. She begged me to come at once, and I saw there was no time to be lost. How to fight against a man dead these many months was a problem that offered no immediate solution. But there had to be an answer. Of that I was sure, and I meant to find it. I left that night by plane to enlist my services in the fight against hate and its vicious allies, the seven deadly sins. Oh, Mr. O'Connell, I'm so glad you've come. I'm so glad. It's been a nightmare. And I'm glad to be here, too, young lady. I intend to see this thing through, no matter how long it takes. Oh, thank you so much. Just take hold of yourself now, until we have this thing licked. First, I want you to tell me everything that happened to Paul since the day you came. Then I hope I'll know what to do. Well, as I told you in my letter, Paul went into radio... His training on the newspaper was excellent, and he turned out several very good scripts. One show in particular he called Happy Valley was seriously considered by several agencies. Paul had written over 30 chapters. You see, it's a daily serial about a disabled war veteran who comes home, and the story he tells about his readjustment into a normal society. What happened to it, Phyllis? He had a meeting two weeks ago at the agency. As I understand it, several people were present... Directors, actors, and the man who was to sign Paul to a contract, a Mr. Henley, the agency's producer. He took Paul into his private office. Everything was going along nicely. They were about to come to an agreement. I've gone over your scripts very carefully. You've got a fine show here, Mr. Blair. I've heard the staff read it, and they all liked it. Well, thank you very much. Very much, Mr. Henley. You don't know how I appreciate all no, this. Don't thank me. I'm a businessman. I'm not doing this out of sympathy. You've come up with something we like, and it's a deal. I'll have my secretary draw up the contracts. Five shows a week, 52 weeks, with an option for renewal, and you'll receive $100 a show. That's the minimum scale, I know, but still a lot of money. Well, that sounds good to me, Mr. Henley. I'm ready to sign. No, excuse me. Surely. Uh, Henley. What? Called off. Why does he have to get a sore throat when he's singing for us? Tell him I'll fly east today. Tell him to meet me at the airport. Yes, I'll leave here in about an hour. He can't do that to me. Hey, Blair, I can't sign your contract today. I've got to rush east. Uh, come back next week. I'll have my secretary get in touch with you. I'll see you later. I'm sorry, Mr. Blair, but it just can't be helped. And so, Mr. O'Connell, that's how it ended. Paul didn't say anything when he came home. He retired early. And sometime during the night... Oh. Oh. What's that? Who's there? Phyllis! Phyllis! Do you hear it? Do you hear it? Paul, what is it? You what? It's my father. He's laughing. Laughing from his grave. Oh, Paul, that's nonsense. I don't hear anything. He's laughing at us, Phyllis. He's responsible for everything going wrong with me. Paul, please. I never should have married. I never should have married. Paul, stop. Stop. You don't know what you're saying. Oh, yes, I do. I know I'm through with everything. I can't stop my father from hating or from destroying me. It's no use, Phyllis. It's no use. I'm through. I'm through. I tell you, I'm through. Part two of Black Interlude follows in just a moment.
And now, back to Black Interlude and Warren William. Next day, Phyllis and I motored out to the mental institution where Paul had been taken. The late Francis X. Blair had a fight on his hands, whether he knew it or not. For a while, Mr. O'Connell, we thought he was going to recover rapidly. But then he got worse. We've been giving him shock treatments, therapy, the usual correctives for his type of illness, but uh, unfortunately... We appreciate everything that's been done for him, Doctor. But I do have some rather interesting facts, which I hope may be of benefit in treating him. You see, Doctor, I represented his father legally. For the next hour, I told the doctor what I knew about the strange case of Paul Blair. I told him of a plan I had that might possibly help to restore the young man's reason. It was a gamble, I knew. But it was time to put our cards on the table. It was now or never. After hearing me out, the doctor agreed to my plan. We left without seeing Paul, but in a happier frame of mind. Later that afternoon, I called upon a friend of mine, a radio broadcasting executive. I told him the story. Uh, what you're asking me to do may cost my job, John, but it's worth the chance. Let's see. Uh, I've got a spot tomorrow afternoon, 3 o'clock. We're changing programs. I'll sandwich your show in. But only for one day, mind you. Believe me, Joe, I appreciate that one day. But if my switchboard is clogged with an angry mob calling for my neck, you know what you'd better do, don't you? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> I'll start running. <laughs> At a quarter of three the next day, everything was in readiness for the experiment. A radio had been slipped into Paul's room. Phyllis, the doctor, and I stood outside his partly open door, waiting for the moment that was to lift him from his black interlude or to plunge him forever into the half-world of fantasy. Dejectedly, Paul sat in his chair, easing off into nowhere. He looked forlorn, despondent. Our plan was a shot in the dark, but we were all praying for it to hit the mark. And then, at three o'clock... Ladies and gentlemen, a new program is making its debut at this time that I hope you'll enjoy. It's Happy Valley, the story of a disabled war veteran who comes back to his home in Happy Valley and to the girl he left behind. Can a blind hero readjust himself to the ways of normal life? Can he pick up the threads of his old world, yes, his old love, and go on as before? The story of Happy Valley is being reenacted today in towns all over the world. Real, true-to-life stories that have been born in the horror of war. If our Happy Valley can aid in the readjustment of just one disabled veteran, then we feel our cause has been most worthy. And now, to Happy Valley. Do you see him? Look, look, he's heard. He's looking at the radio. Oh, pray, Mr. O'Connell, pray. Folks of Happy Valley, as you all know, we're down here at the station today to welcome back our friend and neighbor, Sergeant John Watson. Five years ago, he left us to serve his country. He was just a boy then, and now he's coming back. A hero and a man. Look, Doctor. He's walking over to the radio. He's smiling. Let's give Johnny a welcome he'll never forget as long as he lives. I don't have to tell you that he won't be able to see us. He can only hear us. We all know that John Watson is blind. All right, now, let's let him know we mean what we say. Paul was listening intently now, almost eagerly. Hands in the pockets of his dressing robe, he was pacing the floor excitedly. Would our desperate gamble work out? It had to. Welcome home, Sergeant Watson. We're all mighty happy to have you back. And we're proud of what you've done down to the last man of us. I haven't got the key to the town to offer you. You won't need it. Every home here in Happy Valley is your home, son. Yes, all yours from now on in. Well, 
Thanks, everyone. Thanks a lot. You don't know what this means to me after being gone five years and two of it spent in the hospital. I can't see you, but I feel you, and it's the best feeling I've had in a long, long time. Oh! Doctor! Doctor, Mr. O'Connor, look, Paul! He's fallen! Maybe he's... Turn off the radio, please. Go on. Here, Mr. O'Connell, give me a hand. We'll carry him over to the bed. Careful. Move that pillow, Phyllis. Oh, yes, I'm sorry. There we are. Just leave him here, please. I'll ring for the nurse and we'll attend to him immediately. Oh, Doctor, maybe we shouldn't have done this. Well, there's nothing to worry about for the moment, but I'll have to ask both of you to leave now. I'm sorry, Mr. O'Connell, that the experiment didn't work. No, I'm sorry, too, Doctor. Probably I let my hopes get the better of me. I'll let you know later whether or not this afternoon's experiment had any violent reaction. I'm afraid, yes, though... Yes, Doctor... That... I'm afraid that I made a jumble of the whole business. Thank you again. I'll call you later. Our return trip was a bitter one. We'd taken a chance and lost. Instead of shocking Paul out of his mental depression, my idea had caused a complete collapse. As we walked slowly into the Blair apartment... Excuse me, Mr. O'Connell. Yes? Uh, is, is Mr. O'Connell there? Uh, this is Joe Parnell at the radio station. Uh, I've been trying to locate him for an hour. For you, Mr. O'Connell. Thank you, Phyllis. Hello? Uh, John, where in the world have you been? I've called you everywhere. I just this moment came back from the hospital. Well, the switchboard's been swamped, all right, just as I was afraid of. Oh, listen to this. Happy Valley is a smash hit. Hundreds of people have called and wired their congratulations. Well, I'm happy to hear it, Joe. Only... For heaven's sakes, only what? Only that the idea backfired, Joe. Paul Blair hurt his show at the hospital and... and collapsed before it was half over. The shock was too severe. We fear for the very worst. For three long, never-ending days, Paul Blair lay unconscious on his bed in the sanatorium. I felt chagrined, angry that I'd permitted myself to take such a desperate chance. I wondered through those long hours of Paul's black interlude whether or not the evil voice of his dead father was reaching him. Had Francis X. Blair achieved his bitter revenge even from the depths of his grave? Phyllis and I waited impatiently to learn the answer. Yes? Mrs. Blair, this is Dr. Fry. Yes, doctor, what is it? What is it? Paul regained consciousness about an hour ago. I'm very happy to say he, he appears to be quite rational. He's asking for you. Oh, thank you, doctor, thank you. I'm so happy. I'm so happy. Oh, Paul. Paul, darling. I heard it, Phyllis. I heard Happy Valley. Yes, darling. Oh, it was wonderful. Imagine my show, my first show on the air. Yes, Paul, I know. Mr. O'Connell and I were here when you heard it. Wasn't it wonderful? And you'll be happy to know, Paul, that your show is a smash hit. Service organizations everywhere are behind it. It's on the air to stay. Oh, I, I must get well, get strong in a hurry. Every day is precious to me now. I have new ideas, new shows. And I have you, Phyllis. I know now that our world's going to be new and beautiful. Yes, dear. And I know, too, that Dad finally forgave me. You see... After I heard the show, he stopped laughing. Maybe he heard it, too. Warren William will be back in just a moment to tell you what the official records say about the probate cause of the black interlude. But first, here is a word from our sponsor. Here again is Warren William. 
After a protracted hearing, the court decided that the testator, Francis X. Blair, was of unsound mind when he made his will, and his entire estate eventually went to his son, Paul. He, in turn, gave a large part of his inheritance to a disabled veterans' clinic. Paul is now a very successful writer and author. Just recently, he and Phyllis left for an extended trip through South America to gather material for a new book he's preparing to write. And about the laugh from the grave... Well, frankly, your guess is as good as mine. Did Paul actually hear it? Or was it caused from an oversensitiveness together with a persecution complex? Well, if it's true that love is eternal, why not hate? If the one is possible, why not the other? Yes, why not? Next week, I have a story for you about a last will and a testament that's stranger than any story you've ever read in a book. A pirate and a beautiful girl were shipwrecked on a lonely, deserted island. Unfortunately for him, he was mortally hurt in getting ashore. Because he was possessed of a considerable fortune, and because he felt that he must atone for his past sins, he decided to make a will. But he had no paper, no pencil or ink. And yet he made a written will that found its way back to civilization and the courts. And how did he do it? Well, when you hear the story... The Lady and the Pirate, you'll understand more about it. This is Warren William inviting you to listen again next week. Ken Cripine and directed by Albert Ulrich. This is a Telaways feature produced in Hollywood. Mm-hmm.